Welcome, welcome. This is very exciting. Thank you for joining me today. And we are going to talk about studying. So welcome. Oh, you can hear me. All right. Hello from Iowa. Okay. Uh, let me get situated a little bit so I can read the chat. That's great. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Okay, so as we get started, I want to make sure that everybody's on board. Um, I have sent you a link uh, to test your own executive functions, so please take a minute to do that. Uh, I will send you a quick analysis as to what your strengths are and what your challenges are, if there are any. And uh, that I'll, I have some tips for you as well. Oh, hello, uh, Jennifer from Orange County. How exciting. Somebody from New York. Welcome, welcome. So as you know, we will be talking about, uh, and just a little quick, those who are not familiar with the uh, webinar, uh, you can see the chat chat icon, and then you can also see the Q&A. So take, uh, take a minute to send me a question or chat with each other. I don't think I can multitask that well, or I shouldn't. So I will not be kind of keeping up with the conversation, but I will certainly answer your questions. So um, it's such a pleasure to have you all uh, with me today. Um, so let's start with this question. What's the connection between studying, taking tests, and executive function? Any thoughts? Let's see what people have to say. All right, executive function helps you learn and, and prepare for a test. That's great. Oh, hi, Sue, I see. All right, they are very closely correlated. Uh, Elena, that's absolutely right. Any other thoughts? It helps you process information. Thank you, Monica. Yes, so executive function uh, um, is, if we can think about executive function, uh, these are a set of mental skills that are used to manage your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, uh, to achieve goal. And in the context of a learner, the goals that the learner is trying to achieve is let's say good grade, learning, knowledge. So uh, in terms of um, Jack Naglieri and Sam Goldstein define executive function as it's how efficiently you do what you decide to do. So if I decide to study, how efficiently I uh, study uh, is exactly what um, uh, executive function is all about. So for example, in order to do well on a test, you need to really know what is it that you need to study. And in order to know what to study, you need to be present and focused in the classroom, right? So uh, executive function, as somebody says here, Sue says that it's part of your self-control, which is absolutely true. So let's talk a little bit more uh, in depth. So. Um, this is how I like to describe it. Studying is using executive function to coordinate and orchestrate effort to make meaningful connections between past knowledge and new learning. And then to show that, that knowledge or to demonstrate that knowledge uh, that one has using a measure that uh, determines and assesses that knowledge. So this is what, call, what is called test taking. So showing the knowing requires executive function as well. So let's think about, uh, so why test? It's often very interesting, you know, I've been doing this for the last 20 years, and I often ask students, including elementary to college, why do you think your teacher gives you a test? Um, and often I don't get the satisfactory answer, or, or in fact, if the teacher heard that answer, uh, she, she will flip. <laughs> so what, what are some of the answers you have gotten from your students if you have asked, why are you taking a test? Any thoughts here? Any um, people are typing. So as you're typing, to see if you know the information exactly. Uh, and the, there is a bigger picture, right? The, it's not just knowing the information, but connecting that information to formulate foundation of knowledge. So uh, the test is to ensure learning has taken place. There is a comprehension and understanding and the information that was understood is retained. Because doesn't that happen? I mean, take example for this workshop itself. Uh, do you know I have not provided you with the 
a companion guide yet. Uh, you will receive that right after we finish because I don't want you to get distracted by the companion guide because that will interfere with your learning. So yes, even learning new information requires you to understand something, but sometimes we are deluded by our understanding or the notion of understanding because we might feel that we understand and then eventually we actually, if we are tested on retention, we are not that great at it. And this kind of illusion is very often what happens to students. Um, that's why we need to really think about uh, studying in that context. So <clears throat> why studying is so elusive? And as you know, the word elusive means um, kind of intangible, uh, unpalpable, ambiguous. Uh, do you all agree that uh, learning is, uh, um, I mean, studying is ambiguous to students, even though they are in an institution where learning is happening all the time? Uh, I find that that's the case, uh, certainly. Um, <clears throat> so let's think about uh, the reason uh, it is elusive. It is because it's complicated. Studying is not straightforward. Um, and, and yes, uh, some, somebody said here that it's lacking a purpose. The sense of purpose, if the teacher and the student don't share the purpose together, then yes, the studying may feel futile to a student. So what this, this is a kind of a map that I have created about studying, how, how uh, there are so many implicit processes to studying. So for example, in the beginning, one should be able to know how to learn. Uh, and that learning is actually understanding, a retention, and retrieval. Second, be able to monitor the understanding. Like, do I, I think I understand it. Am I really understanding it? The next one is be reflective about what is understood. That means, what does this all mean? How does this connect to something that I've learned in the past? How does this connect to something in the future? And then be able to resolve confusion and strategize. This is a very, very executive process. Uh, resolving confusion requires you to understand your failure to understand. And, and then, as I said, uh, to strategize, uh, also a very, very important uh, part of strategizing that I often discuss in my talks is called self-devised strategic thinking. That means this is what I do to help myself so that I know what I know and I know what I don't know, so I know how to ask help, whom to ask help, and how to use the, make the use of that help. And then, then comes the step where you're able to uh, retain and then test your retention. And finally, apply that learning to a novel situation. So uh, a practice test versus a real test, uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. And then finally, that's when you can be guaranteed that you get 100%. Uh, <clears throat> now, I grew up in India, and it's very interesting getting 100% was practically impossible. Uh, only, only possible when you took math test, for example. But now I find that even language arts students can score 100. So some, some of this great inflation or this sense of 100% achievement is, is a little bit of a difficult uh, idea to grasp because uh, comprehension um, cannot be 100% accurate because a lot of inferences need to be made and extrapolations to formulate the sense of uh, the big picture, uh, which is, I think, really critical. So take a minute and answer this question. What are some of the strategies that students are using currently in your experience that are not effective? And in spite of them not being effective, students continue to use it. Any thoughts? Yes, so Gloria says that studying only night before. Monica says short-term memorization, absolutely true. Uh, uh, Linnell says that rereading the material, uh, which is not effective, giving up, yes, that is a common strategy, which is uh, in fact not even understanding where to begin. Quizlet, it's uh, interesting, I belong to a, a Facebook group and, and Quizlet often comes in We'll talk a little bit about, I just want to mind you that this is only a one hour presentation. This is a, a full day workshop, in fact. So the material is very comprehensive. So I may not have the time to review every aspect of it, but let's kind of um, review some of the bad strategies first. So um, there are some study myths, and these are the strategies that are not effective, yet students continue to use it. So the first one is highlighting and underlining. Um, and so lots and lots and lots of research has been done, including Air Force uh, basic training, typical graduates, children and remedial students as well. And repeatedly, the research shows that it is not how effective one thinks, particularly how effective the students think. 
The teachers kind of know that this is not the most effective, but researchers often say that this is like a, a blanket for a baby. Do not take it away. Let the student have it. If that gives comfort, let the student have it. So I want to quickly show this is what I did. I was at a Starbucks and I interviewed the, this student. She's an undergraduate student and let's see what she says. Uh, let me see if I can click on the video. Yeah. So share with us one of the most effective studies. Oops, let me see. You have discovered for yourself? Um, from me taking notes from like the textbook usually helps a lot and then like highlighting the most important parts. So when I look over it, that's what I look over. Okay. <laughs> So this is a student I ran into. I don't know this student uh, and even her, uh, uh, as she mentions highlighting. But the, you know when highlighting goes bad is when you see this, right? And so uh, this is not highlighting that's effective. And, and primarily, as you know, uh, highlighting requires discernment. It can be a, a one of the ways to be engaged in uh, reading, but highlighting is choosing the right word to indicate this is what you think is important to comprehension. But what's more effective is writing in the margins about the content that you read than highlighting. So there you go. Second strategy that often students talk about is rereading and looking over notes. And a lot of you have mentioned this. Primarily, this is not such a good strategy again, because uh, uh, reading will not lead to accurate recall. And um, it's, it's not the best bang for the buck. Uh, building better study strategies is a lot more effective than rereading. And a simple principle from memory perspective and studying is rereading is putting information in, but the test taking is all about retrieval. How effectively are you able to take information out? not put, put it in. So rereading night before a, a test is a terrible strategy and we should really discourage students to do that. Um, the next one is cramming, a very popular strategy, particularly in college students, as you know. So cramming, again, is a, a, a John uh, uh, Donlowski often talks about this as a quick learning and fast forgetting. So uh, one of the points that is often lost on students is they think that all they need to do is get through a test. And they're really not thinking about long-term retention of information over time. And this strategy is really uh, terrible, uh, particularly if uh, you're trying to use this information in the future for your personal progress. So the next strategy, of course, is summarization. Um, and this is uh, often reported as a medium successful strategy. Uh, primarily, the only reason this is not the most effective strategy is when students summarize, they fail to connect the, the smaller piece of information to the larger context. And information, they view information in modules or in, in smaller chunks. And uh, that, that's not most effective if you're trying to formulate the bigger picture of learning. So let's talk about what do you think um, study strategies might uh, uh, so let's, as educators and some parents in the audience here, what do you think are the reasons uh, study strategies might not be taught uh, in school explicitly? Any ideas about that? All right, people are typing, so I'll give a second. Lack of time, yes, very, very important reason. Uh, they think the students know how to study. Oh my God, absolutely. Not enough time, Peter, thank you. So you, you are right on the money. Uh, the three fundamental things that come to mind and research shows that the teachers may harbor a belief that a true studentship is to learn how to study on your own. So this may be a myth a teacher may be harboring. Second, teachers themselves may not know how, which strategies are effective and which strategies are not. Because again, the science of learning may not be taught to the teachers explicitly. Uh, you can be a physics teacher if you have master's and PhD in physics, but you may not have any taken enough classes in learning theory or cognitive psychology classes. Uh, and the third one is nothing in daily learning and teaching um, you know, allocates time for the teachers to evaluate and model how a student should study. So some of these are situational predicaments and some of these are just uh, accidental uh, faux pas on uh, our collective parts. So uh, as I'm going along, um, uh, I want to kind of point out to you some of good uh, resources for you to learn a little bit more about this is um, uh, my podcast. I have had some amazing, uh, very, very smart and um, 
incredible researchers on my podcast who have contributed their knowledge and expertise. So this is uh, Dr. Kemmel, and he has um, two podcast episodes, but the one I have linked here is a blueprint for learning success. That, uh, and when you get the companion guide, you should be able to refer to this and click directly to the podcast. And so um, I'm just sharing some additional resources so you can kind of expand your uh, knowledge base as well. Um, and, and thank you, Sue, for saying that the, actually if the teacher is lacking in preparation of student lesson, they struggle uh, with, uh, uh, in terms of sharing that with the students themselves. Um, so thank you for understanding that as well. So continuing with this idea, now let's get into the effective study strategies. Um, so the strategies that work. So the first one, uh, I really like to talk about uh, this bigger picture of learning uh, and contextualizing learning in the sense of a student, a student's single job is to learn and learn how to learn. And, and so first a strategy I recommend is promote how to learn mindset. And so let's think about what is that uh, learn how to learn mindset. So first, I think for that students need to know how to sustain effort. A sustaining effort is maintaining attentional vigilance and bringing your sharp in tuned uh, understanding of uh, our comprehension. Second is diving deep, the willingness to dive deep. So diving deep is a little bit different than sustaining effort. Diving deep requires critical thinking. And the third part is connecting to the prior knowledge, which seems to be one of the most critical ways retention can be improved. So uh, with that, let's look at some of the ways to bring that into focus. So let's start with this one idea, teach students uh, to value uh, and create a distraction-free work, work zone. So uh, I want to kind of share some research, which you probably will find extremely valuable, that uh, on an average, an adult worker gets interrupted or self-interrupts every three minutes, every three minutes. That is incredible interruption. And second, uh, you know, uh, Gloria Mark, she's a professor of informatics at University of California, and her research shows that it takes a, a, a worker an average of 25, 23 to 25 minutes to return to working on what they left off when they got interrupted, 23 minutes. So the cost is extremely high and, and the consequences are dire. So can you imagine a student sitting with their laptops open, access to the internet, their cell phones next to each other, next to them, getting texts, trying to go to Wikipedia, going to the teacher's website, looking at their notes. It is a highly flammable uh, circumstances. So I really think we have to imbibe this uh, value to students that distraction-free uh, um, uh, workspace or study space is, means actually putting away the technology and really uh, maybe getting into the habit of printing paper or printing notes and looking at them, uh, which also, by the way, shows a lot more uh, um, uh, effort and uh, shows great results. So uh, let's look at the next strategy. This is uh, share with the students the idea of memory and division of labor in the brain. So this particular works, uh, Larry Squire, he's a, a very famous researcher who studied amnesic patients. And what he found that patients with amnesia, like memory deficit, who could not remember what happened three minutes ago, showed incredible memory for procedures. So if you taught them certain procedures, they were able to retain the procedures even after six months, in spite of having their memory processes. So what the lesson there is that there are certain things that students engage in, which can go into autopilot. So for example, a student can be highly engaged in highlighting something and give, gives an impression to him or her that he or she is reading, but nothing may be retained. So the metacognitive systems, uh, so there's something called the declarative memory or explicit memory, which, which is memory for facts and events, is stored in a different place in the brain than memory for procedural memory or implicit memory. And those two um, memory functions are served by different parts of the brain, and one can function without the other having the knowledge of the same. So the neuroscience now has allowed us to understand this discrepancy in the way brain functions. So student may be harboring this feeling because I read something, I understood something, I will retain something, or I have a habit of highlighting things or just copying things from a notebook, I actually am going to remember. So that's the fallacy that we need to point out to the student with this idea that they need to know the division of labor in the brain. Uh, any thoughts, any comments, keep sharing. 
That's great. And here are a couple more resources for you. Uh, fantastic. My favorite researcher in the world, uh, Dr. Roy uh, Bomeister, and I uh, had him on the episode uh, on my podcast twice. So please take a minute to listen to these two episodes. His expertise is in willpower. Um, and, and I think will, willpower and self-control, these are two ingredients for uh, self-management and, and highly correlated to effective study strategies. All right, so let's look at the next uh, continuing with this idea that help students connect good grades and strong preparation uh, uh, really matter and bad grades can be fixed. And so at, at the heart of this, as you know, this is talking about the growth mindset. A lot of students are extremely discouraged by the proposition of they will be tested on learning that they have uh, been um, kind of incurring over time. And secondly, they, if they're not good test takers, by the way, you can be extremely smart and a terrible test taker. You and I know these students, right? And, and unfortunately, our culture is not very forgiving of those students. I was one of those students who was not the best uh, test taker on formal tests. But the good news for me was because I grew up in India, a lot of my um, testing involved essay type of writing and I was a good writer, I could describe something. But if you had to pinpoint a particular fact or detail, I was kind of on, a sh on, on the shaky ground. So um, if the student has different style of learning, the, the student needs to harbor a mindset that's a growth mindset. And so a couple of things that you need to teach students explicitly, not lecture them, or not share that as a handout, but they need to get into the habit of looking at their grades regularly because performance can uh, the, the feedback on your actual performance in the past can be a predictor of your future performance. So getting students to see the patterns in their behavior can be extremely valuable. Getting the students to talk to the teacher to get extra credit to supplement a poor performance on a grade. Again, this is a part of self-advocacy that can be extremely valuable. Helping the students to, uh, uh, to understand that uh, kind of multi, um, juggling multiple balls uh, up in the air. That means you may have, you have a math test, you may have an English project, you may be having a science fair and a field trip, and you have to prepare for all of those things. So calendaring skills are really, really important. And lastly, um, as a, as a uh, I don't want to say a final resort, but a really good measure and getting an, a tutor who can individualize some learning, who can actually walk you through diffi difficult concepts and help you understand what you don't uh, seem to understand in a group setting. That can be incredibly valuable. So uh, another fantastic researcher, Anders Ericsson, he is the author of uh, the book Peak, and he also uh, has written uh, multiple, uh, multiple articles about expertise. So his talk about experts are made, not born is a fantastic resource for all of you. So uh, continuing with our journey, uh, the second strategy here is uh, teach a retrieval practice. And this kind of goes uh, and ties with the uh, way memory works. So the, uh, the way memory works, memory has four core uh, elements. One is encoding, which is making meaning. And a precursor to encoding is good attention. Uh, second is consolidation, that means connecting information to past knowledge. The third is a, 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 um, a retrieval, and, and, and whether that's um, unintentional. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And the final is retrieval when you need it. So uh, one of the, uh, the things that is really hard for students to do or see the value of is retrieval practice. So it's, uh, it's to examine retention of new learning uh, in, by practicing retrieval when you don't need it. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have a test next Thursday. So this Sunday, you should retrieve the information that you will be asked to retrieve next Thursday, but there's a Sunday, there is no test. So you don't need it on Sunday, but you do it anyways, because you're helping yourself learn. And that's a fantastic way to self-guide your retrieval. So let's look at that a little bit more in depth. So research shows that repeated testing pr uh, uh, produces better transfer than repeated studying. So uh, Andrew Butler, um, and there have been a lot of uh, studies where they have identified the value for uh, ta uh, taking the final question on the test and answering that question again um, by, um, as I said, on Sunday for a test on Tuesday has proven to be very valuable. But uh, what Andrew's, uh, now Butler's group did is they modified that a little bit even more. So they, they had students learn about bats 
uh, bats echolocation and one group uh, did one pattern of learning and the other group did uh, other pattern of learning. So I'm going to show you this slide. So what they, what they found that the students who did this pattern of study, 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 and then answered the test questions versus the second group who did test, study, test, study, obviously, as you can see, close to 90% retrieval accuracy. So this idea uh, of testing followed by studying, followed by testing and followed by studying. So uh, can you imagine answering questions when you know nothing about things can be incredibly helpful for students to appraise their understanding. And, and this is called self-efficacy skills. So it's really important for students to know what they don't know so that they can focus their attention and direct their effort in that direction. So this is a really important as, as um, you know, there are studies that have been done uh, for even vocabulary learning for Swahili words and their English translation. And they found this approach very, very effective. And so I'm gonna go sl back one slide uh, uh, just quickly if you let me. So retrieval practice is effective when it's followed by feedback. So if you practice retrieval and you made mistakes, if there's some sort type of feedback the student receives, the students are going to do well. And this is the invisible part of learning when the student is studying by, on their own. When you are studying on, on your own and if you answer a question wrong, erroneously, and the answer is wrong and there's nobody to give you corrective feedback, you might say, oh, well, and continue. That's a terrible method. And that's in that context, Quizlet can be very, very effective. One of the problems I have had with Quizlet is students who have executive function challenges, the questions they choose to put on Quizlet are not great. The Quizlet works really well for concrete information such as um, vocabulary quizzing or foreign language quizzing. But when it comes to scientific terminology and understanding and grasping uh, abstract concepts, um, the student's question um, may, may not be very thorough. So one of the things those, those who are um, listening today are teachers, uh, I would invite you to think about um, the study guide that you give. Um, why don't you give half the questions to the students and ask the students to come up with other half of the questions for themselves? And these questions, you can structure them how, why, and explain. And so any question that requires explanation of how and why uh, requires the student to go into the depth of it. So these kinds of formulations are really, really important for the student. So here's another student that I interviewed in the coffee shop at Starbucks, as you can see in the background. So this is what she had to say. So this is a medical student. So by the way, because uh, these are adults, uh, I could get permission for them uh, so that I can show the video. That's why you're seeing these videos. Uh, these are not my, my clients, but it's a great uh, thing to think about. I've been doing, um, I'm close to 100 episodes with my podcast guests. And this is a question I've been asking adult experts who study learning and executive function, when did they first discover their own uh, um, insight into learning? And most of them answer that uh, in college. So here's, here you go. Do, how do you, do you test yourself when you study? Yes. Um, so in the school that I'm in for courses, we have practice questions and different Q banks. Um, and I feel like that's the best way that I learn is sometimes even before I finish reading the material, start by doing practice questions and then by reading the explanations I find out what my weakest points are and then I can spend more time focusing on that than the points that I might have already known that are stronger. Great. All right so that self-testing is a really key element of uh, uh, a, a technique that one should do that retrieval practice. Um, and so continuing with the third method, um, I hope you're enjoying so far. If you have any uh, comments or thoughts, let me know. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, so, okay, so the distributed practice is the third technique. And this is a space uh, um, uh, that you leave in between your retrieval practices. So if we were talking about uh, the earlier, if we were talking about a retrieval practice, which was talking about how to study. Now, this particular strategy is, uh, refers to when to study. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, so there are lots and lots of benefits uh, to distributed practice. It is uh, very, very essential for long-term retention. So do you know, it's a funny joke, but what do you call a um, medical student who graduates last in his class? 
still a doctor. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, whether you have great or uh, worst if, uh, study strategies, if you pass, you're considered a, a competent professional. And so one of the things that is lost on our students is they're not really thinking about the future. They're not thinking how can they, how can they uh, travel through time and be these learners who are passionate about learning information, which eventually they can be uh, referring to as experts when they're in front of people or trying to do well in their businesses. So that's what we do, right? Even I, as a learner and a lifelong learner, I had to study these skills to bring this material to, uh, to you. So uh, secondly, um, when the practices are um, uh, distributed across the session, uh, the, it certainly proves to be much more effective. And um, uh, there's, of course, an element of effective st uh, strategizing that's required. So uh, what's so fascinating, as I was preparing for this uh, um, uh, little webinar, I thought outside education, we see concepts of distributed practice all the time. No one waits the night before to show up at the basketball game, right? And uh, no one says, let's start uh, dancing the night before the dance recital. So we have such explicit and clear understanding for mechanisms and procedures that require a uh, lots and lots of practice, but studying somehow is left out of this equation. Um, so that kind of is a, is a terrible message that we are sending to our students. Uh, so uh, I'll continue with this, uh, this idea that, uh, let me show you how this looks on a calendar. So spreading studying over time looks something like this. So if you look at the calendar uh, a month at a glance, you study geography um, once a week, you do science uh, the following day, you do math a few days later, and then you circle back after a gap of five to six days or a week later, you circle back. So this kind of distributed practice really is, is incredibly valuable to the student because the, the retention or having to judge what is understood and what is not understood only can be tested through passage of time. So for example, if the student plans to cram for a math test by putting in four hours night before, it is a better idea that the student takes that one hour each and plugs that in into the calendar um, every week for four consecutive weeks. Now, this is really hard. Do you know why? Because this requires incredible executive function. This requires commitment through passage of time. This re really requires you to not uh, forget to study. So a lot of times students are highly motivated by seeing themselves perform poorly rather than seeing themselves perform well, right? So students are likely to study harder the day after they get a 79 in English. But the next exam is not for another three weeks. So having to persist with motivation for three weeks is a real challenge for students. That's why distributed practice does not require for the student to be sold on it. This is a matter of structure and organization. So com continuing with this idea, long delays between study periods are ideal. And as I mentioned, it requires you to overcome um, uh, procrastination. Um, one of the things that I want to point out here that uh, there is a formula that the students, um, if you want to retain information uh, um, after, um, let's say, five years, your retrieval should be every six months. And if you want to retain something after a month, your retrieval should be every week. So there's a formula uh, uh, between 30% um, of the time gap that you want to be left uh, that the retrieval practice should be happening that often. So um, another fantastic resource is Mark McDaniel, who has a fantastic book called Make It Stick. Uh, and he was uh, a podcast gets guest three times. But this particular podcast is, is where he talks about learning strategies, which will be of great value to you all. Um, continuing with our fourth strategy, which is contextualizing learning. So help students connect individual experience to prior learning and the bigger picture of learning. So one of the things that uh, I think as teachers, I would suggest uh, if you are teachers that make sure you write the, uh, the big picture idea on the, uh, on the board and ask student, how does this matter? Why does this matter? And if you're a parent, do the same at home. Let's say you learn blah, blah, blah. Tell me why did this matter? Why does this matter for your eighth grade science? These kinds of questions are metacognitive questions, but they also allow the student to deconstruct and reconstruct their lear learning because learning requires analyzing and then um, so analysis and synthesis skills. So analysis uh, skills require analyzing 
and synthesizing requires outlining and summarizing. So outlining followed by summarizing is a different summarization strategy than, than writing a summary of the whole paragraph. If you uh, answer a question, how does this matter to the chapter title? That really will be really, really helpful. And we're gonna practice that in a second. So let's look at this, uh, take a minute. This is eighth grade science. Okay, and this is a chapter review and don't need to read all the questions, but just even if you read the first two questions, what is population? Give three ex examples and then three things, uh, um, you know, what three things does a population need to grow? So if you are thinking about this, you need to have the context of the vocabulary word population. So what do you think population means, guys? I may be sounding facetious, but there's a little trick. So what is your answer, you think? Any idea what population is? All right, people are catching up. They're making some comments. Number count, that's great. A group of people in one area, fantastic. Great, do you know where these definitions are coming from? Your prior knowledge. Right? So as an adult, we have a much broader definition of a population, but let me show you. Um, uh, so of course, the second question was, uh, what, <coughs> what are the three things does a population need? So any guesses, what three things population needs to grow? As I said, this is a awe, love, water, and space. I love it. <laughs> That's great. People, food, water, great. All right, so is it safe to assume that we all are referring to population are, 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 uh, equal to people? Yes? All right, so look at this chapter. What are they talking about? So in this particular, they're talking about a population of chloroplants. So expanding this knowledge that population doesn't only refer to people, also happens through learning, but that kind of self-questioning that if you were guessing an answer to a question, your answer is always going to be limited. And when you gain more information, it expands your mind. So if you are thinking from one lens, which is population equals a people uh, that live in closed spaces, but look at the definition, a group of individual of the same uh, species living in this uh, given area. So the definition here expanded from people to species, which then included living species um, as, uh, that is not human beings, right? So this is how you, the, a student can really begin to kind of incorporate his learning into the broader context. Um, I want to include two more uh, podcast uh, um, uh, episodes for you. This is Bonnie um, a Singer, who is an expert in uh, written language and she's also a fellow speech language pathologist. And these two episodes, we talk about writing and the executive process involved in writing. Because uh, remember, hardly any test taking happens orally. So uh, your ability to show what you know only happens through writing. And students find it extremely boring or annoying to write their answers as an effort to study. So, uh, and a lot of students, so particularly those who have a, a learning disability or learning difference diagnosis really have a struggle in writing um, in a way that yields uh, uh, their knowledge on paper. And, and this is why we need to really teach students to uh, prepare for a test through writing the answers, not reading over. So continuing, the last strategy here is a metacognitive strategy. So metacognitive strategy is a, um, it's, so this is a quote from uh, Karpik, who has done, uh, and Butler, who have done a lot of research in learning strategies in students, and they say students clearly lack awareness of effective strategies uh, and need direct information from teachers about it. So uh, we have to kind of help teachers um, know this, and the teachers then need to trans transpose this knowledge and information to their students. So continuing with that, so I love this little uh, four boxes of knowing. Uh, this is kind of adapted from Skip Walter, who, who uses this model in business. And, and so what you don't know, you don't know. And then there's what you know, you don't know. Then that's the metacognitive awareness. I know, I don't know this. But in that tiny box, you see that yellow, that is actually what you think you know, but the mistakes you made in knowing. 
So that yellow box is what the prior test performance or trends in the classroom. And this yellow box needs to be incorporated into study strategy. So what do my teachers think of my knowledge is a question a student should be answering in effort to build their metacognitive strategies. So, um, so let's talk about uh, uh, some of these ideas of uh, thinking intensive uh, learning or reading. So it's really important that students get uh, uh, students are taught this habit of um, looking at the end of the chapter, end of the unit uh, questions, and particularly the critical thinking questions, and see if they can answer it. Um, you know, Khan Academy's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, founder uh, talks a lot about this flipped classroom. What is a flipped classroom? You do the, do the learning at home, and you discuss the mistakes in the classroom. So imagine you, uh, in uh, effort to begin a new unit, you give the student a baseline learning quiz and have the student answer it erroneously, and then make that worksheet as a template for modifying and building their learning. So imagine every week you have the student answer those questions underneath the ones that they answered the first time when they had no idea what this content was about. Then they can begin to compare and contrast the knowing and not knowing what they don't know. And the gap can begin to bridge. So I hope this is making sense to all of you. So teach how to dialogue with the author. Uh, one of the things that is missing in study strategies for students is self-advocacy. How do I ask good questions? A lot of teachers have fantastic opportunity for students to come. I'm having a review class, come and see me. Uh, so kids that I work with with executive function never show up. Or they might show up, but they do not know what to ask the teacher. They literally do not know what to ask the teacher. So you know what they're doing? They're sitting in the back and wasting their time. And the teacher is surprised because teacher is saying, hey, I'm here to answer any questions you have, but they don't know what questions they should have. So this idea of dialoguing with the author. So let's say if the student is taking notes and the notes are shabby, no problem. The in the margin, teach the student to ask a question to the author. So who is the author of the note taking, note taker? The note taker himself. So a student should say, I don't understand what I mean by this. If you are looking at the text or the handout, you should be literally asking this to a teacher that, okay, what is it that I should be at? I don't understand this concept that the, te the text is explaining to me, but I don't think I get it. And now those questions can be taken to the teacher and then you begin to tailor your own need by asking a very specific question. And I, I apologize, this is a lot to ask of a student and a lot to ask from a teacher and a lot to ask from a parent. So I am so <laughs> amazed, how did we get through education as adults who are listening to this? But it is a daunting process, but the science is so clear. If we did these few things, it is exponentially going to increase students' ability to test themselves. So I got the feedback earlier that somebody was not able to hear the voice too well, and I don't have the best way to increase the volume because I'm at max. So I'm gonna skip over this uh, video. But this uh, young woman was talking about teaching to her cat. So uh, teaching always is um, uh, proven to be an effective strategy, uh, a good metacognitive strategy. However, cats do not ask questions. So <laughs> teaching to an inanimate object is really not that effective because you don't get pushback. So asking, uh, so forming a study group where three students uh, are sitting and one student is teaching is a great scenario. And, and you can assign the other three students um, a job to ask at least one question. That's when the metacognitive process is going to be um, uh, upped. So uh, we are coming to the end of this. Uh, let's talk about this metacognitive inventory. These are self-guided questions a student should ask. I highly recommend you print this on cards and give, this student, uh, give a student a copy of this, and they should be referring this to uh, every time they're beginning to study. The questions are pretty fabulous, I think. They are, do I understand what I'm learning? The answer should be yes. If the answer is no, what will I do? So it, it is that problem-solving chart. Uh, I should go and ask for help, or I should reread. Uh, or I should actually maybe watch uh, a, a video on it. How will uh, I do if I'm tested on this material? I have a fabulous suggestion for teachers that a teacher should ask a student 
Um, and I have developed a software that trains executive function and builds these skills. And I have this embedded in every element that student trains their executive function with, which is called EXQ. But I suggest all of you, if, if you uh, can, those who are teachers here, uh, ask the student to predict their grade on top of their page and ask them to write three strategies they use to answer the test questions and give them 10% of their grade if their actual prediction, their prediction and actual grades match, and if the strategies are valuable. Now what you're doing is you're incorporating uh, executive function development and suggestions, um, uh, enhancing their self-awareness as well. All right, so uh, just quickly uh, uh, to answer the question of uh, some of the participants, yes, yes, yes. We are going to make this uh, PowerPoint available. It is called a companion guide. I am extremely delighted to share with you, so you do not need to take any notes. I hope you're fully attentive and paying attention. And it might be a great idea. I have a little learner quiz at the end. If you take the time to do the survey, see if you can retrieve new learning and see how much of it you're actually able to retain. It's a great way to test your uh, learning to learn skills. All right. so. Uh, as we come to closing, I'm leaving some time for you all to ask me questions. Uh, I, one thing I get off, uh, accused of uh, quite often is I'm very, I speak really fast. I apologize. Uh, I'm very excited about what I have to share. And often I have a lot more uh, content than time. So that's why I speed up. But now I feel very relaxed as, as I am coming um, this home, bringing this home. So let's, let's review this. Executive function is figuring out the goals and then directing effort and attention towards the goals in an adaptive way. And the emphasis here is adaptive. You know what adaptive means? Adapt means shift, shift, shift. And most important study strategy is to let go a strategy that's not working. And this is where many, many of our students are stuck. They're still old, using age old strategies, strategies that don't work, strategies that make no sense, but they feel afraid to let that go because it is almost like walking through a, a territory that is unfamiliar to them. So I hope you take some time to uh, really teach students a, a special way to uh, kind of take the time to uh, evaluate their capabilities and skills and then start thinking about how do I strategize for the next uh, test or, or examination that I'm taking? Uh, one quick comment about projects and, and uh, uh, book reports. Uh, they are not traditional test taking measures. Um, uh, one of the things they do not put pressure on is retrieval. So a student is not required to retain information and retrieve from memory. So, but with the project uh, um, organization process requires understanding the bigger picture. So uh, I think I might do a workshop on project planning as a, as a separate process of learning how to study. Uh, but in this context, the most important thing uh, for the student to remember is to how, how to um, refer to a golden standard. A lot of students, when they are asked to manage their information, manage their learning and produce a um, um, produce a product as a project, they do not understand what other students are going to do. And hence, they are completely operating in, the, in a blind. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can also teach them that is a form of evaluating their retention and learning and how well they have formulated knowledge. So in closing, learning how to learn cannot be left to students. It must be taught. I wish I said that. <laughs> this is a quote uh, by a, a very famous researcher. And I highly, highly uh, endorse this quote. I live by this quote. I see uh, everything that I do in my work with students and teachers and educators and SOPs and psychologists is about how to bring this understanding back to the students. And I hope you have learned a lot. Uh, do you have any questions for me at this point? I will pause for a second. Um, Oh yeah, so do we have questions here? Okay, teach teachers first, then teach students. Absolutely right, and maybe staff meeting would be a better uh, appreciated if administrators would follow the same format. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Laura, for saying that great information. I really appreciate you listening to this. Uh, oh, I have some friends. Hi, Jidnia, thank you for joining me today. Leslie, yay. Um, 
Uh, are there some questions? I uh, have to go up. All right, give me a second. Uh, I'm not really familiar with this. Give me one second. Okay. What is it? Okay, sorry, I missed the questions. I'm trying to spot it. Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, how can I help my uh, neuro uh, atypical child language uh, deficiency with executive function? Thank you for that question, Gloria. Yes, very, very important question. One of the challenges or the burden is really increased for a student who has language-based learning difficulty because the entire avenue for processing information happens through language. So really building the foundational skills of um, uh, meaning, so semantics, uh, syntax, uh, pragmatics. So having the understanding of uh, single units of language is really, really important. Having the inferential skills and um, some of the things that um, I haven't gotten a chance here to talk about because this requires a lot more in-depth uh, knowledge is how do um, it, it requires to make something called extrapolation. Extrapolation is a, um, a king size inference. So that means you have smaller units of information that you're learning and you have to have a key idea or main ideas that begin to emerge and all the main ideas when put together create a sense of the big picture which is called gestalt and this is where the students are missing out a, a lot so one of the ways to teach that is getting some specific training uh, in, in that is really really important uh, yes and Maria uh, to answer your question how can we obtain the slides as soon as you hang up we will be sending an email with a link for you all to download uh, uh, this uh, presentation and uh, so suddenly you will have access to that. Oops. Uh, do I have an echo? Uh, all right, so in closing, I am thinking that uh, we are um, all set. Uh, thank you again for joining me today. You are a fantastic audience. You are so engaged and I hope, hope you found it very, very useful. And uh, if you have any suggestions, do they? Uh, please take the survey. Uh, as soon as you hang up with Zoom, you will have a survey. Please answer some questions. And, uh, and secondly, um, uh, please suggest any topics that you might like to listen uh, in the future. So thank you very much. And it was such a pleasure to be with you.